Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this webinar on uh, Master Frame. Uh, my name is Martin O'Gara, and with me today, answering your questions, is my colleague Tommy White. Uh, today's seminar is uh, the first of three, um, a three part series covering uh, Master Frame training in particular. And today we'll be looking at the geometry aspect of Master Frame and also some uh, viewing and uh, member viewing and, and frame viewing options that are available to you there. The other two seminars uh, will be covering uh, other ex aspects of Master Frame and uh, the next one of those is actually next Tuesday. So if you're not signed up for that, uh, you still have time to do that. So let's begin. Uh, what I would like to perhaps, be given this is the first of, a, of the three parts of these uh, seminars, is just to take a look at where Master Frame sits in terms of the overall system of Master Series. And I have a little image here which explains this in some detail. Master Frame is one of our modeling programs and is indeed our core modeling program. Uh, but in, it, it, it does sit with other modeling add-ins such as our 3D Model Manager, our Master Key Wind Analysis and our Master Frame FE. So we'll be focusing purely on Master Frame aspect of the modeling environment today. Many of you might have Master Frame without having the other aspects and indeed there are separate webinars which uh, discuss each of these other areas as well. But also Master Frame as the core part of the analysis program also links on to various different types of design and also all the way through to drafting. We can see here as well we can also begin a Master Frame model from various third party sources such as CAD sources or Revit, XDOS, DrewCAD etc. And we'll be doing a little bit today looking at how we can start a master frame model by importing a DXF file. So as I say, today we are looking at geometry and how we can put together the geometry of your frames using master frame. So let's begin. Uh, we shall come into master frame. And I would like to simply just take a quick race through some typical master frame projects that users have been doing. So we have like a roof type structure here, um, small single story type structure. I'll not explain each one of these in detail, but very, very quickly you can see towers, scaffolding, stair type systems, domes, uh, stadia, um, even something to support a jet engine, uh, ground beams, uh, small foot bridges, more domes, industrial type structures. So really we can see that the uh, the variety and nature of structures handled in master frame is quite quite wide and uh, really any type of frame structure that you can imagine we can handle in the master frame type system. It is a multi-material modeling environment as well. It's not just steel or concrete but you can model steel, concrete, timber, whatever material you can think of. Um, also adding on to master frame is the master frame FE which we won't be covering today but you can also handle within the master frame environment with the FE add-on things like slabs and shear walls and the likes as well using your shell type element analysis. I'm just going to show you quickly the type of structure that I'm going to generate here today. This is a little preview of what I'm just going to do and hopefully not spend a very uh, long amount of time doing it. So we'll be looking at in detail the various ge geometry features of Master Frame and how we can use those to generate that. We'll also then be looking at something a little more complex and how we can handle stuff that's um, off the grid axes and the likes. So so let's um, start off a new frame and try to attempt to recreate what we have here. So we'll just call this Geom1 for me and create the new file. Now we're going to use one of our preprocessors, the various different types of preprocessors here. And it might be from the preview saw most obvious to choose a portal frame type preprocessor. But to illustrate a few more features and uh, functions, I'm going to actually take something that's a, a little bit further away and, and, and create the type of frame that I want. So I'm going to create a plain frame to begin with. You might take a look at these preprocessors and say, well, actually none of those really suit what I want. Well, our advice would be always choose something from the preprocessor and you'll find with the host of geometry, geometry editing tools we have, you'll be able to transform that into something that is what you would require. So t starting off with a, a basic skeleton in master frame. And I'm going to change that down to three spans naturally from what I'm trying to achieve. 
and actually I'll just take that into one story with a default span of 25 and actually I'll change my middle span down from 25 to 20 meters in distance and uh, also change my height up to 7 meters also. So a, a 25 meter wide, 7 meter high bay arrangement here. I'm not going to put on any loading or anything like that because that's all going to be covered in the next series, uh, next actual webinar. But putting loading in here would pop some basic loading onto the beam systems of what I have here. Also there are some options in this preprocessor to implement simple construction or if you've got loading to do alternate loading. Um, and those are obvious there what those would achieve for you. So just proceed to activate that change and close down the preprocessor. So let's have a look at the geometry tools that we have available to us here. Looking at our overall master frame menu we can see this is laid out in a nice logical sequence. We're not looking at this 3D model uh, menu here today because these are exclusive tools that belong to the master series 3D model manager add-on and as I say there are separate webinars which deal with that so we'll not be touching those today. The majority of what we do here today will be found in this geometry menu. Here is where we add new members and new nodes. Uh, we'll also be taking a look at how we create views of those members and nodes uh, to make our job easier, particularly with larger frames. And then the other aspects will be reserved for later, the other parts two and three of this uh, set of webinars. I suppose maybe for the completely uninitiated, it is useful to note that we are dealing with a nodes and member based system here. So we've got nodes which are the endpoints and members which always go between two nodes. So a member always goes between two nodes and a node point is always at the end of a member. Simple um, set up for structural analysis. To create the type of frame I want here I'm going to take a look at the geometry menu and one might be tempted to go into uh, define a new node first of all and then snap members to it and indeed I will do that as one of my approaches but as we'll see as we continue it's not often necessary that you would need to edit and manually add nodal coordinates based on a coordinate type system but we will do that and I'm just going to show my X and Z coordinates here so to show that that is 25 so I'm going to put in an X coordinate of 12.5 and that's 5 there, 0, and also a Y coordinate of 10, giving me a new node point at this location. So I'll close this area down here now, and I'll come back to my geometry, and this time I'm going to define new members on a snap grid type of approach. I notice over here that I'm defining new members based on existing nodes and members, so if I move my mouse around I can see that I'm snapping to node points, and I can very easily snap from here to here to create one new member. And I'll just take those coordinates off to tidy up the view. And then of course another one going from here down to here to produce that type of portal frame arrangement that we saw. Now one might also notice that as well as snapping at node points I also get intermediate member snap points. And this is because of the distance or percentage box that we have here. We have a default of fifth quarter, third or half point percentage snap points. But if I were to click on that just to clear that box, we notice that clears those intermediate snap points and I get just simply nodal snap points. And that's useful sometimes to do that if you don't want to accidentally click on the intermediate part of a member to, when you're generating new members from nodes to nodes. Also this is quite convenient in that I could type in a distance of 2.25 without the percentage sign and I do get absolute snap snapping at this distance away from either end of any member and we'll see how that will be useful as we continue. Perhaps what I would like to do is um, add in my mezzanine floor level at this location here and uh, I'm just going to briefly come out of this area to delete this actual member. Now I can actually shortcut shortcut to that command to delete that member from here but back to the geometry menu just to show that we have delete nodes and delete members and of course we want to delete a member and we'll pick that member up and we'll proceed. I will see as we go through a lot of these geometry editing functions that they are all quite similar in the way that they operate. You have a notion of selecting a set of nodes or a set of members. We then also then have the opportunity to preview or change by saying show new frame 
and saying proceed will activate the change. Just a quick note on the methodology of selecting nodes and members. When you select a member you can either click on a member to select it or click on it again to deselect it or indeed draw a window. Now, if I draw a window like thus, um, as long as I capture the center of a member it's included in the selection. Obviously if I go like this as long as I don't go down past the center of those columns it will just be the beams. And again it doesn't matter whether you window left to right it's the same um, but if I window the existing selection it is a toggle to select deselect. If we then can come back to the area to define new members I would like to define more members down in this region for the uh, mezzanine floor level. However, uh, to do that, um, I would like to add in a few columns in these locations down here. And we can see that using the snapping to existing nodes and members that I'm not able to snap down at these locations. And this is the, the time when we need to change to a different type of interface, and that's a snap grid, whereby we get points at any intersection on the grid that we set up. And that's the key, how we set up this grid to locate the members to be precisely where we want them to be. We have a default one meter spacing of this grid, but of course if I wanted to place a column which was um, 6.5 meters away from this column here, then the current grid would not, wouldn't be able to do that for me. So the key is to change the spacing of the grid to make it nice and easy for me to, to get exactly what I want. So and I will also change the height of the grid to be 3.5 which is half of my 7 meter high and now I get the opportunity to snap in a column which is exactly 6.5 and 3.5. And and also if I wanted to put in another column there like that but say for example I want my other column to be 6.5 meters away from this point then the second trick is to realign your snap grid to one of your nodes that you would like to offset yourself from. So realigning that then gives me the opportunity to add that column in at these spacings from this location. And if I now go back to my existing nodes and members, and I'll just clear that distance or percentage like I was explaining previously, I can now go across and do an ortho snap into those locations. And in fact if I go all the way across those nodes, the program will know not instead of intermediate and independently clicking on them, the program will know to automatically intersect that and I can see that I've got uh, lots of additional members here. Now if I were to um, try to take another member from here up to here I notice that I have these nice ortho snapping tools coming on to me myself here but also another one is a perpendicular snap too. Now those are controlled by buttons that we see down here for uh, snap uh, perpendicular to and uh, orthogonal etc but there's more than that and we'll see those in just a second but I'd like to do an ortho snap straight on to that location there. If I uh, would like to say add another member at a certain distance offset from that I can do that of course by clicking there and saying that I want 2.75 a 2.75 distance away from there and that gets me a snap point from there to there and I can do another um, orthogonal snap point up to that location. Of course anything you do can be undone and redone using a global undo and redo step by step. We do have an individual functions in undo command down here but that's like an undo back. It undoes all the commands or additions or changes you made since you entered this particular function. So it would actually undo all the members that I've added. But a step by step undo will do that three steps back getting rid of those nodes and two members. So proceeding with uh, let's say to make a similar change to the other side naturally without the mezzanine floor here I if you recall I added a node by editing coordinates and uh, actually adding in a new node uh, based on nodal coordinates. This side I don't want to do that I want to make use of my existing member to produce the portal type slope. So I'm going to come up to the um, geometry menu again naturally and this time I'm going to say that I want to split a member to insert some additional nodes. Of course I only need one node in the center of this member but I'm going to split it actually up into four segments 
to illustrate a few additional features here. So this program is expecting me to select members to split. Also, if you look at the cursor, that also often helps you also. It looks like a little hand holding a member, so I know that the program is expecting me to pick a member, and it also tells me down here that I'm selecting members. So it's always useful to keep your eye on what the focus is on this side, and also what the cursor is asking you to, to select. So that's the member to split. I'm going to split that up into four segments, and I will say proceed on that. And quite simply, you can see those extra node points in there like that. I'll just turn off the drawing of the nodes explicitly. Um, we can see actually when we turn off the drawing of the nodes explicitly that we still get little node blips at certain locations and you get those at the free ends of members but also where you've got a node on a straight line that's not connected to anything else. You see that so you actually know that there is a node there. Uh, otherwise naturally you know there's a node at this location because you've got member intersections that's a given but in this location you wouldn't otherwise know that so that helps you there a little bit in that regard. To create the rafter slope I'm going to make my way down this menu and go to the shift XYZ. Now you can see I'm not working my way down through every single command and function in these menus because there's lots of them there and it would take a long time so I'm really just looking at the key ones that are most commonly used. So let's go to the shift XYZ which takes an existing node or set of nodes in this case I'll just simply pick one node and tell it that I want to shift it in the y direction at a distance of four meters to match the rise of the other side. Show the new frame gives me a preview and proceed activates that change just like the other editing functions. So let's reset that nodal selection and again similarly as I explained how we select members the, the concept of selecting nodes is really even simpler Quite simply, it's a select deselect process as previous. Or we can window, and naturally, any node that you've captured in your window is selected, and that's a select deselect process as well. And again, it doesn't matter whether you go left or right, top to bottom, the windows always perform the same function. Naturally, I could make my job very easy here and pick these two nodes and say I want to shift them in the y direction by two meters, given that they're uh, equally spaced. But just to show off a few more features. Let's come along and come to uh, a position nodes on a straight line command, which will do that quite nicely for me, which would obviously work particularly well when these nodes are, say, lots of them, and they're all uh, unequally spaced on this line that we want to make nice and straight. So position on a straight line, let's reset our selection of nodes and pick the three nodes. Now the program's going to automatically node to position these three nodes on a straight line between the two extreme nodes. So there's not always a need to select the start node and end node of the straight line that you want to go between. So if I were to say show the new frame on that, you also need to be aware of which option you have chosen here which dictates where about on the straight line this node is going to end up. So if I say show new frame with the perpendicular to line option, I'll just draw the nodes a little bit more positively and if I just toggle that on and off you can see that that is actually moved perpendicular from its original point to that point on that line which is sometimes what you want. Maybe in this case I might say retain the X coordinate and you can see it moves up ever so slightly to be again halfway on the X axis between those two because that's where it was originally. Now I can say proceed with that again to activate that change and actually out here I'm going to make my job uh, a little bit more interesting by adding in a new member, a little canopy member out here and I'm going to want that to remain on the slope with that line. So let's go back to defining some new members and I will go to snap grid and use my wheel just to roll out a little bit here and I'll have myself an X spacing of 2.25 meters with the origin of the grid located at this point as exactly the same methodology I used for these columns down here and let's snap myself in a little extra canopy member there and going back to my position nodes on a straight line. This time I'm going to pick up all these nodes but now I'm going to say I want the start node to be at this apex and the end node to be at the top of this column and when I say show the new frame it produces me a straight line 
between those two start and end node points that I've specified here and here. If you notice how I actually make that selection of the start and end node points, I click on start node, it puts the cursor into that box and the program now is expecting me to pick something to fill that box and it's asking me to pick a node as you can see from my little cursor. Once I click it automatically jumps on to the end node so I don't need to do anything, just click a second time on the other node and that's it selected. So let's uh, proceed with that. As you can see there's lots of uh, nice features here as well. If this was attached to another member for example and I wanted the alignment of that member to remain uh, there are options to do that and also options to keep super members straight which we'll talk a little bit more about later on. So proceed with that. And actually I'll say to retain the x axis on that, or x coordinate on that type of arrangement there as well. So we're starting to see some of the nice new uh, ways in which uh, the geometry can be manipulated and such. Um, say over, for example over here I would like to maybe shift this column uh, uh, maybe not this column but say the, the one underneath it to create a transfer beam type situation. Let's go back to change the coordinates shift X Y Z and you might say well actually let's shift these two nodes of this column in the X direction let's say by minus one meter. And the problem with shifting the two nodes of the member to, to shift the whole member is that it shifts also the column above. Actually I would like that column obviously to remain vertical. Now to do that I actually will proceed with the shift of that but then I redefine this member to go from that point now down to this point. Redefining a member takes an existing member and moves it to a new location as opposed to creating a brand new member all over again. Um, oh actually I see that when I've done that shift it actually shifted previously selected nodes so I'll just undo that come back to that shift again. It's useful to keep your eyes open, see what you're doing. Because the nodal selection hadn't been reset, it also shifted my previous selection of nodes and by the minus one again. And let's go back to redefine ends of an existing member is what we're using now. Not define new member but redefine ends of an existing member. So picking on that member and so we've selected the member to redefine and now simply we'll say that we want to move it from its original point down to an ortho snap point splitting that member and that now recreates that member in its new location. Excellent. All that we really have remaining to do now is to pop in, if you noticed I had a truss arrangement in the middle here previously uh, and we're going to do that by adding a new frame. So let's delete that member first of all. Uh, so we come to delete not delete nodes but delete members. Delete node will delete all members connected to that node. So it really is just delete member that we want and proceed with that. And now we can come back to the geometry and we can say that we want to add a frame. And really this add frame can call upon any of the original preprocessor options that you saw to add lots of different types of frames to this frame. Um, and the new frame you get from the preprocessor obviously can, can be configured in the same way. Also if you have a completely other previous master frame file that you had generated you can import that frame from its from the other master frame model hence merging two master frame models together. So let's uh, simply work with uh, a lattice truss here for this arrangement and just to uh, really move this out of the way I am going to say that go into origin and orientation and I could say that I want to move this in the x direction by the 25 meters up in the y direction by 10 meters I'm in the wrong place here 25 and 10 and we can see this moving up out of the way uh, the 2011 version actually will give you the option to say that I want to place this truss between two nodes and it will automatically rescale it and bring everything into line to automatically connect between these two nodes. But for this version, I'll just tickle that up a little bit more to get it out of the way. Uh, let's go back to frame data and we'll change it to a 20 meter span because I know that's the distance I have from here to here. And uh, 
yes, I'm happy with the overall scale of this and the number of half panels and such. I'll not bother changing that. I might drop that down to five to make it a little bit chunkier or there in that business. So let's proceed with that. And I'm going to make a change to this little truss before I drop it into position. Coming back to my position nodes, I, I've used position node on a straight line. Now I'm going to use position nodes on an arch. So let's select all of these nodes. Again, I'll not specify the start and end node because it's just going to take the two extreme ones. And I'll specify a camber of something in the region of 2 meters. So let's uh, proceed with that. Or show the new frame and proceed with that. I might also then uh, simply try and drop those nodes down a little bit to reduce the depth of that truss say by minus uh, 0.75 or something like that in the y direction and now all, all that remains for me to do is to float that truss into position and of course I do that using the shift x y and z so I will reset the nodal coordinate selection and select all of the nodes now of this truss and instead of having to work out how much I need to shift this down by I'm just going to say move this node to this node, so move node 28 to 24 to node 8. Show the new frame and proceed with that to activate that particular change. Excellent. Now of course the model I showed you just a moment ago was a, a three-dimensional frame and we have indeed just been working with a plane frame here in, if I display my axis, in the X, Y plane. Quite simply to make this into a three-dimensional frame, one of the most useful tools that we have is the option, wrong menu, to duplicate. And there are a couple of different ways in which we can duplicate. So let's simply choose the first one, duplicate nodes and members, which is a translational duplication, simply going in a, in a directional fashion, whereby it initially selects all of the nodes in the structure, which is what I want for this particular instance and we can say that we want to shift this frame in the x direction by six meters and let's have a further five of those frames also very importantly noticing that I have the tie members checkbox up here which when I say show new frame produces the secondary members between the duplicated nodes and obviously lots of them here in the truss which may, I may or may not want but of course I can come along, come along and very easily delete any additional members that I don't want uh, with my delete member function afterwards so it's probably better to have these time members in and remove the ones that I don't want. You might notice here that the end of this little um, canopy isn't tied and that's because it decides not to tie the free ends of members such as the basis of columns and the likes of here until I would say tie at basis which is really tie at the free ends that aren't connected to anything else and I get those members in that fashion and again I can delete any ones that I don't want afterwards, so I'll just proceed without that. Uh, but also, as well as that duplicate function, we have a duplicate by rotation. And again, it's selected everything, but this time I want to be more selective in what's going to be duplicated. So let's reset that, put it in the uh, plan view, and this time just select the nodes and members of that individual bay with the curved truss. We also then want to specify what angle or what plane of rotation which is the plan so we're going to rotate it out. Uh, so let's that's absolutely fine let's go for an angle of something like uh, 15 degrees. Let's go for a number of repeats of 6 and let's go for the center at this point instead of so we don't actually have to say okay what's the x coordinate it's 70 let's type in 70 there the program knows that I'm expecting to pick a node to give me the x coordinate and uh, it's actually not giving me what I want there so I'm just going to have to type that in uh, and let's have a look at the z we can have a, a study of that to see of course the z is 0 so let's go for 0 um, show the new frame on that and if I look at that on plan I can see my nice frames coming around. Let's turn off those coordinates and of course tie members to connect everything together and that's uh, 
quite elaborate what we've managed to end up with there. So I will say proceed with that. Um, but this duplicate function is also very very useful not for duplicating large parts of frames but also for a smaller scale to produce additional members where you might want some. An example of that might be if I were to come to duplicate nodes and members. Let's reset that selection. If I wanted to create a little canopy on the other side, let's put myself back on front view. And I'm on front view of the entire structure. So if I draw a little window around here, I select all of the nodes in the depth of the frame. Now, so all I need to do is say I want to have a repeat of one, but in this instance I want to move it down as it is on this side with the slope of the rafter. Let's zoom in a little bit here using my wheel, my middle wheel. Um, so I need to know how much I need to shift it by in the x and y direction, but I don't actually need to work that out. We have another little function down here which says to duplicate along a member. So I'm selecting that particular rafter as the axis I want to duplicate along. And the length I'm going to say minus 2.5. I say minus because it's going in the other direction of this member. So that gives me my component x and y shifts which look about right in terms of their sign convention to me. So if I say show the new frame that gets me my little extra canopy in the way that I would expect to see it. Just going to turn on my DirectX um, graphics here to uh, use my graphics card to draw the frame instead of uh, standard facilities, which will make the, the drawing of the graphics that bit faster and, and nicer as well. Okay. Um, I want to take some time now to um, have a look at how we can manage the viewing of this structure. How we can when we're continuing to work with the structure instead of always looking at one whole large set of members it's really not that big a set of members but obviously if you're working with a, an extremely large structure you wouldn't be working with the entire view set or of members at any one particular time you'd want to be looking at a particular area and having the ease of working with the your model in sections and segments uh, when you proceed particularly to do things like loading and properties and the likes so we're going to, we're going to look at that today also and that's moving across to the different menu here, the viewing menu. But just before I talk about things like frame views, I want to take a, a look at our basic zooming and panning techniques that we have. Most of the zooming you will do will just be with the middle mouse button, uh, the middle wheel. It's useful sometimes to just click with the middle mouse just to set the focus to the, the frame. And we notice as I roll in with my wheel, it actually centers on what I'm zooming on and if I come down here I get the same thing like that. Also instead of the mouse wheel if you were to click with the middle mouse button and then move up or down so this is a, a middle mouse button click not a middle mouse button wheel gives me that also left and right rotates whereas uh, if I want to do some panning if I hold my shift key down with the middle mouse button down that gets me a pan just like you like a real time pan that you'd expect to see in AutoCAD. So wheel to zoom, shift middle button to pan is really your main functions there that you have. Uh, also if I hold my control key down while holding my middle button middle button down and moving, I rotate left and right, but also then rotate up and down with the control key pressed down. So those are a few basic zooming and panning options there for you. But that doesn't change the amount of members that I have on the screen. It might me get me closer to a particular area but it doesn't change what the whole member set that I'm viewing on the screen. And one of the quickest and easiest ways we have to slice into a frame to reduce your set of members you're working with is the zoom filter. Now this is really like a slice function if you like. It doesn't alter the number of members in your frame but if I were to put this like this and say I want to zoom like so, it reduces actually the number of members that are visible. I can't do anything or select anything of the other members that were outside of that cut that I made or that view slice that I made. To get back to where I was, let's right click and say zoom full frame. 
and I'll put myself back on an isometric view. So you can see there it's quite often not very useful to do a zoom filter while you're in 3D orientation. Where it is most useful is let's say you place yourself in one of your principal plan or elevation views. While on plan I might decide to slice in to a particular section of the building and now I'm just looking at that particular section of the building and furthermore let's put that on a front view and now let's slice in to something we have here. So further cutting in uh, to reduced member set. Now where you might want to create those sorts of views where you have a reduced member set to work with instead of using this which is a throwaway type zoom um, we can also then create permanent frame views which you can recall which can be added to this list. So you can do that by calling create frame views from here or using this button here to add some more frame views. So I'm going to call this um, new view grid AA. Let me put my frame on plan view and if I can imagine that this is grid line AA I slice in simply draw a window just like I did with my zoom window a moment ago but that automatically sets the range of the X, Y and Z of this view. But also I like to say what orientation I'd like to see this view when I call it up. So let's put it on front elevation. And while we're here let's proceed and do another one. Grid BB. And this time let's go to the second grid line in. And again putting it in front elevation. Let's create a slightly different one. We'll call this uh, floor plan. Uh, level 1 and put ourselves in front elevation from the top toolbar up here front elevation that is and let's slice into this part to create, select that mezzanine floor again setting the view and the range of the members. This is really just a box an XYZ box in space and everything inside that box would be part of that view and of course when we call that view up we want it to be on plan view so now we've set up a few views, let's see how we can use those. Close that down and of course we go for grid AA and just to prove the point, if I go to isometric view I am just working with what I have here on grid AA. Grid BB is the same and floor plan level 1. Here we have all the members at that mezzanine floor level. It can quite often be useful to see with your reduced member set where they are in relation to the overall structure and this is a very useful uh, option here called show outside zoom which shows the other part of the frame in a different color so you can actually see where you are okay so we can see how that's quite useful and uh, let's take ourselves back out to full frame view but of course that's not the end of the story in terms of how we can manipulate our frame views. If we come to here we also have something called member viewing groups. Nodal viewing groups are more about labeling. Member viewing groups are, are another way of reducing our member set that we see on the screen. So member viewing groups are different in frame views in a very specific way. Frame views allow you to see everything inside a certain XYZ block. Whereas member viewing groups allow you to pick a member from one side of the frame and other members from another side of the frame and have nothing else in between. A nice example of that in this frame might be your portal frame rafters. And if I were to put this on a front view and draw a window, I need to be in a, an add remove member mode for this particular group and draw a window like that. The problem I can see here is actually selected the other tie members there as well. So let's clear that group again. Of course I could go around and deselect them. But let's be a bit more clever of how we actually select these. And we're going to use another type of filtering here based on orientation. So if I say I want to filter to horizontal, vertical, but inclined is actually what I want here. And I can see when I filter to inclined members, I can actually just pop that on plan and draw a window around that side, another window around that side and I've got all my portal frame rafters selected there. So let's just take that client member filter off again and of course I can add new groups and create more groups and keep going in that front 
um, but we won't because uh, of time restrictions. To actually call up that viewing group again, we need to go to the viewing options. So if I right click show viewing options and I have here the opportunity to view member viewing groups and portal frame rafters. But of course I can um, the, the, the member viewing groups allow me to say hide the selected group so you get the, the negative of that but also if I have lots of groups I can say multi select on the groups and pick more than one group at a time so it's very very flexible of how those groups would work. How, how is that type of uh, filtering useful to us? Well um, if we can imagine we'd like to change the section size in these rafters to one whole section size which will be coming in our next webinar reducing the set of members that are visible to us allows us to easily window them and do that in one operation as opposed to having to individually pick them because of other members getting in the way. So member viewing groups are, are very very useful uh, along with your frame views and of course all of these viewing groups and also views are all can be superimposed with each other I can say show me grid line A as well as that filtering of member viewing group to get me the particular members in that set that are on grid line A. So let's just turn off that and take ourselves back to full frame view. So there we have some uh, look at various different viewing and filtering options that we have available to us there. You might look at this frame and say well everything we've done here is very straightforward lovely orthogonal axes apart from perhaps this curve around here uh, but it's nothing terribly complicated and we would like to see how the master frame will cope with something that's uh, has lots of members that are all sorts of different off-grid axes and I have a perfect example of that in another model and let's save that why not and I have just a little slice of a frame here which has a floor plan and if I put it on plan view as we can see there is very little uh, on axis grids that we can see here or uh, on any of these members and we've got a lovely set of uh, tools and facilities in all our different areas to help you deal with this here quite easily. For example if we come to the define new members that we looked at previously well we know that um, if I were to zoom in down to one of these areas here and I wanted to put a new member across from here to here we know that once we click on the first end yes we do get our ortho snap point we will get our perpendicular to snap point but also I get a project from so that's a member projecting precisely from this other member hence going in, the, in a line with it to give me that type of member orientation. More interestingly uh, let's find another example in another area. If I were to come to the likes of here I get another option called perp from instead of perp to. The green dot here is perpendicular to. There's a slight difference between the perpendicular to and the ortho in this case but you can see here the cyan giving me perpendicular from this member and in fact there's another cyan point which gives me perpendicular from this member. So really let's turn off those intermediate snap points so we can actually see those more clearly. You can see even in an off-grid type situation how these type of snapping points can make your job quite a bit easier and of course those can be turned on and off as you would wish. If you have the 3D model manager you'll be able to put on grid lines to your structure and you'll get snapping to grid lines there also but that is a 3D model manager type feature. Another very useful facility when dealing with off-grid type of situations is if we were to come to our shift area change shift XYZ and I wanted to shift let's say for example um, these set of nodes to increase the spacing and I'll just actually increase the size of the drawing of my nodes so you can see my selection more clearly but I don't want to shift it in the X direction or the Z direction but in this direction of this member and we have again here like in the duplicate and a long member facility whereby it doesn't really matter which one of these members but it really just defines the axis that I want to move it along by say minus three meters 
and that will produce a shift in an off-grid axis according to the member that I've selected. Very very similarly in the duplicate if I want to create another whole set of members duplicating from an off-grid axis if I were to say to turn myself around this way so I can I'm using my control plus by middle mouse button move click to get my me where I want in terms of rotation so let's select all of these nodes and this time let's say duplicate along this member so I can see my X and Z axes up here and a length of 5 meters and I can say of course that I've got three repeats as well and show the new frame to give me that if I put that on its proper axis you can see it moving in that particular direction also in the define new members area where we've got uh, define new members of course we have our snappings like we explained just a moment ago but if we want to move to snap to snap grid and I wanted to create a new member out in this direction of course it's only working on the orthogonal grids but I can absolutely completely rotate that orthogonal grid according to an angle or to two particular nodes so let's select this node and this node to realign the orthogonal grid to that axis and again as previously we can change our origin to say this node and our Z spacing to say the five meters that we wanted and now I get a five meter member which is perfectly perpendicular to this line because of the two other nodes that we selected down here so let's park on that so some examples of off orthogonal um, member generation there we have uh, another very useful facility here called define new members in a floor panel and that allows you it's particularly obviously specifically for a horizontal floor panel arrangements let's just turn off the drawing of the nodes here and again it's uh, expecting me to pick a panel so really it picks the panel automatically for you provided you have this box checked and I've heard to pick a large panel like that I now have a whole host of options of how I can insert a member or a series of members inside this closed panel arrangement so I would like to say that I would like to insert new members which are parallel with this back member here at a distance of three meters and I would like to insert four of them at that equal spacing of three meters from this base point down here there are other options such as insert a single member through a node point or um, insert members through all the node points uh, but I think that's what I want here for this one and if I say show the new frame I can see those array of members being generated like that but I'll not proceed with that for this frame okay uh, we shall leave this here and now I want to talk about how we can generate a new frame by importing a DXF type file if I can uh, start up my AutoCAD uh, and fortunately I think I just have AutoCAD 2008 on this machine but this will do absolutely fine and in the meantime I'll just exit from master frame I'll just say no to any changes we've made on that taking ourselves back out to the front screen of master frame over in AutoCAD let's open up this DXF file it's not necessary to open up the DXF file before you import it but I would like to show you it so you can see what's actually going on there I have a file here called mflaird.dxf obviously nothing absolutely remarkable about what I have here but there's a few features I'd like to point out to you one is that we have various different layers on the system here so if I select certain members we can actually see that I've set them up into layers and really I've just named these layers according to the section size I would like these members to be the layer, layering and the integrity of those layers will be maintained and will be useful to us when we bring that into master frame that's the first thing the second thing is we know in master frame we would like to we would actually have two members we would have a member going from here to here and another one going from here to here 
but in AutoCAD I've drawn just one line and it's actually beneficial to me that I would draw that one line because the program will take that line and split it automatically for me but in the process of splitting that line it will maintain it into something called a super member and super members are something we haven't touched upon yet but many of you would be familiar with the concept in that of course we need two analytical members here but for lots of reasons particularly design reasons we would like the program to know that they are part of one member keeping this line here as one line will allow the program to create that super member automatically during the DXF importing process hence you will automatically get all your super members generated for you if you have your lines drawn in that fashion in this end I've intentionally created a few problems here such as a disconnectivity of a member now this is uh, disconnected by a reasonable amount it's not that hard to see it if it were a very close tolerance disconnectivity I was just a few millimeters that will be automatically tidied up by the program in the DXF import I think this probably lies outside the tolerance for the program to do that so we'll see how we can handle that and tidy that up and clean that up also I've introduced another little problem here for myself in that I've got two lines which completely overlap each other here hence they're not intersect at this point or they do intersect but they won't join at this point because there isn't a member end so let's just close this down and say no to that and we'll do an import of that DXF file to import that we come from the front screen of master series import a file and we can see here it's not just obviously DXF files we have uh, files from uh, multi-steel from Strucad, uh from 3d plus and also uh, from Revit which um, is actually our own file which we generate from our own Revit add-in tools and uh, we'll be taking a look at that in another whole separate webinar at some point in the future as well so a DXF import uh, let's browse to that uh, master series and we are in here and in here and I've got my MF layered dot DXF so I would like to import uh, these layers here so you can selectively choose which layers you would like to import and which layers you would like to leave behind um, I don't have any points if I if, if this were a floor plate with no columns I could have put points where I want the columns and this would have allowed me to drop in columns at this stage at those points but I have my columns modeled and quite simply it's going to generate this file for me in this location and I'm happy with that and I'll tell it to extract that and load the master frame to see that file and this is exactly what you would expect at this end this file let's have a look at the um, the member viewing groups so show viewing options and I'll just pin this actually in place so it doesn't pop in and out and in our member viewing groups I can see here I have my 203's my one two three one three threes and all the different ones so quite simply we're not covering section application here today but I can could very easily now go into the section properties and window a 203 102 onto those this is just the name of the group this isn't hasn't actually applied this section property onto that member it was just the name of the layer in AutoCAD and hence the name of the member viewing group in master frame and as I said I could uh, say multi select to say show me that group and that group uh, or uh, do the reverse of hiding those but the little few problems that we had and how we can tackle those if we zoom in here I can see that I've got this disconnectivity which hasn't rectified itself but how do I know that how do I pick up on that and see that that's a problem well there's a few clues first of all you remember earlier I said we draw little blips on member ends that aren't connected to anything else well I would just turn on my DXF you see that a bit more clearly I wouldn't ordinarily expect to see a note drawn there but I do see that so that's my first clue that there's a problem there and if I were to zoom right down in and just regenerate that to rescale that I can see the problem I have there now in the master frame we have in the edit in the geometry we have a set of model cleanup tools 
we have pack nodes and pack members which get rid of duplicate nodes and members which is automatically done at various stages anyway we also have an auto split uh, I don't think of any instances here of that but that would occur where you've got one long member and another coming into it but not connected properly and that would automatically pick up that type of instance and do that connection for you but the one that I'd like to pick up on here is the show and merge coincident nodes If I turn off the drawing of those nodes here I can say show me nodes that are within uh, a 100 member tolerance limit from each other and that actually must be more than 100 mil um, let's go for something like 200 millimeters and I can see now I'm getting these nodes highlighted so of course uh, where nodes are very close together this is more useful uh, and I can see in there naturally that this is something that's a problem and here's where you can fix it as well you can say merge that node I need to be in that little box to do that and merge that node with the other node now there is an order here I'm merging node 64 with 65 so node 64 will move to 65 which is what I want if I click again that would reverse that which is not actually what I want I can see 65 will move to 64 but let's do it the right way clicking again to toggle back to where I want to be and proceed to activate that change also uh, I can see here if I draw the nodes let's turn the node numbers off I can just by visual inspection here see that I don't have a node in this location so the geometry split two members and intersection will allow that to occur for me so let's go between here and here to split that and create that node just a few little tidy up operations there after that DXF import I did say about the generation of these super members and I can see here that that DXF import has created all of these super members for me and in exactly the fashion that I would like them to be in as I see there those two members joined together now those super members are convenient in terms of geometry as well because if I were to come to let's say shift nodes and if I were to grab uh, these two nodes to move this column say in the Z direction by minus two meters if I say show the new frame on that that would actually kink those super members and break their definition as such as well because super members do need to be straight but because we have them as a super member I have this handy little function here called keep super members straight which automatically readjusts the intermediate nodes as you can see here it actually retained the direction of those members it's easier to see it on plan if I take that off again and proceed and it automatically parametrically reconfigures the geometry to try and keep everything in balance so meaning that you don't have to do that as a separate operation ladies and gentlemen that is all we have time for today I believe we have covered everything that we had intended to cover which is always a good thing everything that we see here and everything we've done today it will be recorded and uploaded to the webinars section of our website in fact as master series users you don't even need to go to the website I'll show you where you get them on the website in a second but in here and show me how videos you if you're connected to the web you will have a web videos section which dynamically links itself to the web and there's a webinars section which links you to all the master series webinars that have been and gone you can see here actually we have a previous master frame parts 1 2 and 3 which these series is a slight variation and repeat on but also there is a general master frame overview webinar which takes an overall look at master frame and where it sits in the overall system so that can be quite useful to you as well if you're completely new to master frame our next webinar is actually next Tuesday and that covers part two of master frame where we'll be looking at the application of section properties and load generation perhaps with a few other little bits and pieces thrown in as well just remains for me to say thank you very much for your uh, time here today we hope you've learned something and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar thank you very much